Myths of the Norsemen from the Eddas and Sagas by H. A. Gerber Chapter 1 The Beginning Myths of Creation Although the Aryan inhabitants of northern Europe are supposed by some authorities to have come originally from the plateau of Iran in the heart of Asia, the climate and scenery of the countries where they finally settled had great influence in shaping their early religious beliefs, as well as in ordering their mode of living. The grand and rugged landscapes of northern Europe, the midnight sun, the flashing rays of the aurora borealis, the ocean continually lashing itself in fury against the great cliffs and icebergs of the Arctic Circle, could not but impress the people as vividly as the most miraculous vegetation, the perpetual light, and the blue seas and skies of their brief summer season. It is no great wonder, therefore, that the Icelanders, for instance, to whom we owe the most perfect records of this belief, fancied in looking about them that the world was originally created from a strange mixture of ice and fire. Northern mythology is grand and tragic. Its principal theme is the perpetual struggle of the beneficent forces of nature against the injurious, and hence it is not graceful and idyllic in character, like the religion of the sunny south, where the people could bask in perpetual sunshine and the fruits of the earth grew ready to their hand. It was very natural that the dangers incurred in hunting and fishing under these inclement skies, and the suffering entailed by the long, cold winters when the sun never shines, made our ancestors contemplate cold and ice as malevolent spirits, and it was with equal reason that they invoked with special fervor the beneficent influences of heat and light. When questioned concerning the creation of the world, the northern skalds, or poets, whose songs are preserved in the Eddas and Sagas, declared that in the beginning, when there was as yet no earth, nor sea, nor air, when darkness rested over all, there existed a powerful being called All-Father, whom they dimly conceived as uncreated as well as unseen, and that whatever he willed came to pass. In the center of space there was, in the morning of time, a great abyss called Gnungagap, the cleft of clefts, the yawning gulf, whose depths no eye could fathom, as it was enveloped in perpetual twilight. North of this abode was a space or world known as Niflheim, the home of mist and darkness, in the center of which bubbled the exhaustless spring Hvergelmir, the seething cauldron, whose waters supplied twelve great streams known as the Elevagar. As the water of these streams flowed swiftly away from its source and encountered the cold blasts from the yawning gulf, it soon hardened into huge blocks of ice, which rolled downward into the immeasurable depths of the great abyss with a continual roar like thunder. South of this dark chasm, and directly opposite Niflheim, the realm of mist was another world, called Muspelsheim, the home of elemental fire where all was warmth and brightness, and whose frontiers were continually guarded by Surtur, the flame giant. This giant fiercely brandished his flashing sword, and continually sent forth great showers of sparks, which fell with a hissing sound upon the ice blocks in the bottom of the abyss, and partly melted them by their heat. Ymir and Aurhomla as the steam rose in clouds, it again encountered the prevailing cold, and was changed into rime, or hoarfrost, which layer by layer filled up the great central space. Thus, by the continual action of cold and heat, and also probably by the will of the uncreated and unseen, a gigantic creature called Ymir, the personification of the frozen ocean, came to life amid the ice blocks in the abyss. And as he was born of rhyme, he was called a Hrimthurs, or Ice Giant. Groping about in the gloom in search of something to eat, Emir perceived a gigantic cow called Althomla, the Nourisher, which had been created by the same agency as himself, and out of the same materials. Hastening toward her, Emir noticed with pleasure that from her udder flowed four great streams of milk, which would supply ample nourishment. All his wants were thus satisfied, but the cow, looking about her for food in her turn, began to lick the salt off a neighboring ice block with her rough tongue. This she continued to do, until first the hair of a god appeared, 
and then the whole head emerged from its icy envelope, until by and by, Buri, the producer, stepped forth entirely free. While the cow had been thus engaged, Emir the giant had fallen asleep, and as he slept, a son and daughter were born from the perspiration under his armpit, and his feet produced the six-headed giant Thurgomir, who shortly after his birth brought forth in his turn the giant Burgomir, from whom all the evil frost giants are descended. Odin, Vili, and Vey When these giants became aware of the existence of the god Buri, and of his son Bor, whom he had immediately produced, they began waging war against them. For as the gods and giants represented the opposite forces of good and evil, there was no hope of their living together in peace. The struggle continued evidently for ages, neither party gaining a decided advantage, until Bor married the giantess Bestla, daughter of Bullthorn, the thorn of evil, who bore him three powerful sons, Odin, spirit, Vili, will, and Ve, holy. These three sons immediately joined their father in his struggle against the hostile frost giants, and finally succeeded in slaying their deadliest foe, the great Emir. As he sank down lifeless, the blood gushed from his wounds in such floods that it produced a great deluge, in which all his race perished, with the exception of Burgelmere, who escaped in a boat and went with his wife to the confines of the world. Here he took up his abode, calling the place Jotunheim, the home of the giants. And here he begat a new race of frost giants, who inherited his dislikes, continued the feud, and were always ready to sally forth from their desolate country and raid the territory of the gods. The gods, in northern mythology called Isir, pillars and supporters of the world, having thus triumphed over their foe and being no longer engaged in perpetual warfare, now began to look about them, with intent to improve the desolate aspect of things and fashion a habitable world. After due consideration, Bor's sons rolled in Mir's great corpse into the yawning abyss, and began to create a world out of its various component parts. The creation of the earth. Out of the flesh they fashioned Midgard, as the earth was called. This was placed in the exact center of the vast space, and hedged all round with Emir's eyebrows for bulwarks or ramparts. The solid portion of Midgard was surrounded by the giant's blood or sweat, which formed the ocean, while his bones made the hills, his flat teeth the cliffs, and his curly hair the trees and all vegetation. Well pleased with the result of their first efforts at creation, the gods now took the giant's unwieldy skull and poised it skillfully as the vaulted heavens above earth and sky. Then, scattering his brains throughout the expanse beneath, they fashioned from them the fleecy clouds. To support the heavenly vault, the gods stationed the strong dwarves, Nordri, Sudri, Austri, and Westri, at its four corners, bidding them sustain it upon their shoulders and from them the four points of the compass received their present names of north, south, east, and west. To give light to the world thus created, the gods studded the heavenly vault with sparks secured from Muspelsheim, points of light which shone steadily through the gloom like brilliant stars. The most vivid of these sparks, however, were reserved for the manufacture of the sun and the moon, which were placed in beautiful golden chariots. When all these preparations had been finished, and the steeds Arvaker, the early waker, and Alsvin, the rapid goer, were harnessed to the sun chariot, the gods, fearing lest the animals should suffer from their proximity to the ardent sphere, placed under their withers great skins filled with air or with some refrigerant substance. They also fashioned the shield, Svalin, the cooler, and placed it in front of the car to shelter them from the sun's direct rays which would else have burned them and the earth to a cinder. The moon car was similarly provided with a fleet steed called Allsvider, the All-Swift, but no shield was required to protect him from the mild rays of the moon. Mani and Sol. The chariots were ready, the steeds harnessed and impatient to begin what was to be their daily round, 
but who should guide them along the right road? The gods looked about them, and their attention was attracted to the two beautiful offspring of the giant Mundulfari. He was very proud of his children, and had named them after the newly created orbs, Mani the Moon and Sol the Sun. Sol, the Sun Maid, was the spouse of Glower, Glow, who was probably one of Surtur's sons. The names proved to be happily bestowed, as the brother and sister were given the direction of the steeds of their bright namesakes. After receiving due counsel from the gods, they were transferred to the sky, and day by day they fulfilled their appointed duties and guided their steeds along the heavenly paths. The gods next summoned Nott, Night, a daughter of Norvi, one of the giants, and entrusted to her care a dark chariot, drawn by a sable steed, Hrimfaxi, Frostmane, from whose waving mane the dew and hoarfrost dropped down upon the earth. The goddess of night had thrice been married, and by her first husband, Nagolfari, she had had a son named Aud, by her second, Anar, a daughter Yord, Earth, and by her third, the god Delinger, Dawn, another son of radiant beauty was now born to her, and he was given the name of Dag, Day. As soon as the gods became aware of this beautiful being's existence, they provided a chariot for him also drawn by the resplendent white steed Skinfaxi, Shining Mane, from whose mane bright beams of light shone forth in every direction, illuminating all the world and bringing light and gladness to all. The Wolves, Skull, and Hati But as evil always treads close upon the footsteps of good, hoping to destroy it, the ancient inhabitants of the northern regions imagined that both sun and moon were incessantly pursued by the fierce wolves Skull, Repulsion, and Hati, Hatred, whose sole aim was to overtake and swallow the brilliant objects before them, so that the world might again be enveloped in its primeval darkness. At times, they said, the wolves overtook and tried to swallow their prey, thus producing an eclipse of the radiant orbs. Then the terrified people raised such a deafening clamor that the wolves, frightened by the noise, hastily dropped them. Thus rescued, sun and moon resumed their course, fleeing more rapidly than before, the hungry monsters rushing along in their wake, lusting for the time when their efforts would prevail and the end of the world would come. For the northern nations believed that as their gods had sprung from an alliance between the divine element, Bur, and the mortal, Bestla, they were finite, and doomed to perish with the world they had made. Mane was accompanied also by Hyuki, the waxing, and Bill, the waning moon, two children whom he had snatched from earth, where a cruel father forced them to carry water all night. Our ancestors fancied they saw these children, the original Jack and Jill, with their pail, darkly outlined upon the moon. The gods not only appointed sun, moon, day, and night to mark the procession of the year, but also called evening, midnight, morning, forenoon, noon, and afternoon to share their duties, making summer and winter the rulers of the seasons. Summer, a direct descendant of Svasud, the mild and lovely, inherited his sire's gentle disposition, and was loved by all except winter, his deadly enemy the son of Vinsual, himself a son of the disagreeable god Vasud, the personification of the icy wind. The cold winds continually swept down from the north, chilling all the earth, and the northmen imagined that these were set in motion by the great giant Hrisvelger, the corpse swallower, who clad in eagle plumes sat at the extreme northern verge of the heavens, and that when he raised his arms or wings, the cold blasts darted forth and swept ruthlessly over the face of the earth, blighting all things with their icy breath. Dwarves and Elves While the gods were occupied in creating the earth and providing for its illumination, a whole host of maggot-like creatures had been breeding in Amir's flesh. These uncouth beings now attracted divine attention. Summoning them into their presence, the gods first gave them forms and endowed them with superhuman intelligence, and then divided them into two large classes. Those which were dark, treacherous, and cunning by nature were banished to Svartalfheim, the home of the black dwarves, 
situated underground, whence they were never allowed to come forth during the day, under penalty of being turned into stone. They were called dwarves, trolls, gnomes, or kobolds, and spent all their time and energy in exploring the secret recesses of the earth. They collected gold, silver, and precious stones, which they stowed away in secret crevices, whence they would withdraw them at will. The remainder of these small creatures, including all that were fair, good, and useful, the gods called fairies and elves, and they sent them to dwell in the airy realm of Alfheim, home of the light elves, situated between heaven and earth, whence they could flit down wherever they pleased, to attend to the plants and flowers, sport with the birds and butterflies, or dance in the silvery moonlight on the green. Odin, who had been the leading spirit in all these undertakings, now bade the gods, his descendants, follow him to the broad plain called Eidavold, far above the earth on the other side of the great stream Ifing, whose waters never froze. In the center of the sacred space from which the beginning of the world had been reserved for their own abode and called Asgard, home of the gods, the twelve Isir and twenty-four Asenur, all assembled at the bidding of Odin. Then was held a great council, at which it was decreed that no blood should be shed within the limits of their realm, or peacestead, but that harmony should reign there forever. As a further result of the conference, the gods set up a forge, where they fashioned all their weapons and the tools required to build the magnificent palaces of precious metals, in which they lived for many long years in a state of such perfect happiness that this period has been called the Golden Age. The Creation of Man Although the gods had from the beginning designed Midgard, or Manaheim, as the abode of man, there were at first no human beings to inhabit it. One day, Odin, Vili, and Ve, according to some authorities, or Odin, Hernir, or the Bright One, and Lodor, or Loki, Fire, started out together and walked along the seashore, where they found either two trees, the ash, ask, and the elm, embla, or two blocks of wood, honed into rude semblances of the human form. The gods gazed at first upon the inanimate wood in silent wonder. Then, perceiving the use it could be put to, Odin gave these logs his souls. Hernir bestowed motion and senses, and Loder contributed blood and blooming complexions. Thus endowed with speech and thought, and with power to love and to hope and to work, and with life and death, the newly created man and woman were left to rule Midgard at will. They gradually peopled it with their descendants, while the gods, remembering that they had called them into life, took a special interest in all they did, watched over them, and often vouchsafed their aid and protection. The Tree, Yggdrasil Allfather next created a huge ash, called Yggdrasil, the tree of the universe, of time, or of life, which filled all the world, taking root not only in the remotest depths of Niflheim, where bubbled the spring Hergelmir, but also in Midgard, near Mimir's well, the ocean, and in Asgard, near the Erdar fountain. From its three great roots, the tree attained such a marvelous height that its topmost bough, called Lerad, the peace-giver, overshadowed Odin's hall, while the other wide-spreading branches towered over the other worlds. An eagle was perched on the bow Narad. Between his eyes sat the falcon Vedfolmer, sending his piercing glances down into heaven, earth, and Niflheim, and reporting all that he saw. As the tree Yggdrasil was evergreen, its leaves never withering, it served as pasture ground not only for Odin's goat Hydron, which supplied the heavenly mead, the drink of the gods, but also for the stags, Dane, Dvalin, Duner, and Durathor, from whose horns honeydew dropped down upon the earth and furnished the water for all the rivers in the world. In the seething cauldron, Virgilmir, close by the great tree, a horrible dragon called Nidhogg, continually gnawed the roots, and was helped in his work of destruction by countless worms, whose aim it was to kill the tree knowing that its death would be the signal for the downfall of the gods. Scampering continually up and down the branches and trunk of the tree, 
a squirrel, ratatosk, branch borer, the typical busybody and tail bearer, passed its time repeating to the dragon below the remarks of the eagle above, and vice versa, in the hope of stirring up strife between them. The Bridge by Frost It was, of course, essential the tree Yggdrasil should be maintained in a perfectly healthy condition, and this duty was performed by the Norns, or Fates, who daily sprinkled it with the holy waters from the Urda fountain. This water, as it trickled down to earth through branches and leaves, supplied the bees with honey. From either edge of Niflheim, arching high above Midgard, rose the sacred bridge, Bifrost, or Asabru, the rainbow, built of fire, water, and air, whose quivering and changing hues it retained, and over which the gods travelled to and fro the earth, or to the Urdar well, at the foot of the ash Yggdrasil, where they daily assembled in council. Of all the gods, Thor only, the god of thunder, never passed over the bridge, for fear lest his heavy tread or the heat of his lightnings would destroy it. The god Heimdall kept watch and ward there night and day. He was armed with a trenchant sword, and carried a trumpet called Gjallarhorn upon which he generally blew a soft note to announce the coming or going of the gods, but upon which a terrible blast would be sounded when Ragnarok should come, and the frost giants and Surtur combined to destroy the world. The Vannas Now although the original inhabitants of heaven were the Aesir, they were not the sole divinities of the northern races, who also recognized the power of the sea and wind gods, the Vannas, dwelling in Vanaheim and ruling their realms as they pleased. In early times, before the golden palaces in Asgard were built, a dispute arose between the Aesir and Vanas, and they resorted to arms, using rocks, mountains, and icebergs as missiles in the fray. But discovering ere long that in unity alone lay strength, they composed their differences and made peace, and to ratify the treaty, they exchanged hostages. It was thus that the Van, Niord, came to dwell in Asgard with his two children, Frey and Freya, while the Asa, Hernier, and Odin's own brother, took up his abode in Vanaheim. This concludes Chapter 1, The Beginning.